Hello and welcome back. This is Colin Keeley here. And I'm Brent Sanders. We are two guys buying and building wonderful internet companies. Yes, indeed. And we've been talking uh, a fair amount on these episodes about Constellation Software. So it's this dude named Mark Leonard who started Constellation Software and they're into what are called these, these vertical markets versus horizontal. Like maybe you could explain the difference there. My understanding is, is, is what we're going after, right? We, we have been looking at businesses that are like super specific, like invoicing software or CRMs for bowling alleys, whatever it is, something that's very specific that in my mind, the big advantage is, is like you, you you get a customer and it's really hard for them to churn out. Or I shouldn't phrase it that way. There's very little churn because it's so specific and you're one of three or two players in a specific space. So we've I've been learning a little bit more about Constellation, but I think you just shared uh, some of your notes, you've been going super deep on on <laughs> intelligence gathering around it. What's the thinking first off around this company? Like what, it, what has attracted you to it? So he is one of the best deployers of capital ever. So a little bit of background on Mark Leonard just to begin. So he's the billionaire founder of Constellation Software, which is a conglomerate of 500 plus of these vertical market software companies. And so this all started... So I, I've been taking notes on this for like years and it's easy in Rome to tag them all. And right. then I just started organizing them and I've been working on this post, which I just finally made live for years. And it was always in draft form and I finally cleaned up all my messy words and made it open. But so he is super duper private. So he had a bad experience with the press a long time ago where it sounds like someone took his words like out of context. Mm. And since then he hasn't talked to the press at all. And so he's the most press shy billionaire ever, but he does have annual letters. So I've read through all his annual letters and he's done a few interviews with like people he works with. And occasionally it will leak out as like an MP3 file and then I'll immediately get scrubbed from the internet. So <laughs> if you want to DM me, I have an MP3 file and I'll send it to you on Twitter. I sent it to you already. I yeah. don't know if you listened to that, but that was a pretty good one. So Mark is 6'5", 280 pounds, allegedly with a Gandalf beard. And there's only three photos I could find of him in existence. So it took him seven years to go through college. He played basketball, football, and rugby was his best sport at the time. And then he got into some crazy jobs. He was a Mason. He was a grave digger. He's a dog handler. He's a wind energy researcher. And then he eventually went to business school and ended up in venture capital. And so while in venture capital, it wasn't going like particularly well, he was always irritated by VCs focus on these companies with large adjustable mobile markets. And so he saw plenty of these great companies operating in these little niches, like you alluded to uh, bowling alley CRMs and that kind of thing, <laughs> but they didn't have like huge potential upside. So he wanted to raise a fund just focused on these like mission critical VMS software companies. And he, well, I could stop wherever, but the next step was he raised $25 million Canadian from his old venture colleagues and from Omers, which is a pension fund up in Canada with the goal of becoming the best VMS buyer in the world. It makes a lot of sense. I, I totally understand that perspective after spending some time in, in the venture world where also like the other part of this is, is you're not worried about product market fit at the earliest stages. It's like pre series A where it's here's an idea and there's a huge market. And can you connect these dots from afar versus something that just makes sense? And I, I hate to say it, but I feel like in, I could be just projecting, but I feel like having a nice diverse set of work before getting into this kind of world definitely helps. Like seeing how real businesses work and, and getting your hands dirty on, you know, it, I don't know if it has to be a grave digger, but it doesn't hurt. Maybe there's something around resilience around that, but either way, like, Things that are simple and make sense, it's hard to make that connection in venture. And, and that's why it's so hard, I think. It's, there's a lot of glitz and glamour around, I think, this idea of picking winners, which is almost part of the mystique of venture, of seeing the potential and in, in you're investing in the people, not necessarily the idea and, and assuming they're going to get to the right market. And it's just like a lot of things have to go right. And versus this world where I should say vertical market software, where it's, yeah, there's a business sort of a uh, niche that, that exists and the stickiness is, is really strong. And so it's, if you can provide good service to small markets and, and do it in, in multiple ways, I, I don't see what's wrong with that. 
the one thing I didn't mention is like how he's performed. So he raised this $25 million Canadian in 1995, which is equivalent to 35 million US dollars today in mm. the size of a fund. And later he took the company public because he had to give uh, an exit to his VC investors, his pension fund investors, which was the bulk of the fund, were happy to continue going on. And so this has resulted, he took it public at a roughly $70 million valuation. So 33 to 70 million. And now today, they never raised any additional funding. And today is valued at $31 billion. is <laughs> reliably <laughs> compounded at 30 plus percent a year. Oh my God, that's great. All this time. And so the way the business works is, he acquires these businesses. They cash flow really nicely. They don't necessarily grow that much, but he uses that cash flow to acquire more businesses. Right. And so last year in 2020, allegedly they acquired 90 plus of these small VMS businesses. And these businesses, like I'm saying, my favorite part of them, they're sticky. You don't have a ton of churn. They're very specific. One of the things I feel like you mentioned was like Harbor software. How many Harbor software platforms are there? And so as you look at the space, there aren't a ton of incumbents and there are not a, a lot of like new entrants in the space. But the other part is it, it's software. So it's high margin, right? There's not a lot going on to I'm sure so these businesses probably have sales and support and, and a handful of people, but they don't really, that's not like the thing that's generating the income. Yeah. So what makes these things so attractive? It's recurring revenue, right? Software as a service. They're super sticky. So they have high switching costs. They make up a small share of the customer wallet, typically 1%. And it really just isn't worth the hassle as we've talked about a bunch of other times before to switch these things that don't make up a big cost, but it provide a bunch of value to you. And then they are the software. So the asset light. So if you don't have any major you know, capital investment requirements, you could downsize the business. You could cut it down to one person, like one engineer keeping everything up and running mm. if you need to. It's super high margin. So that's where all the cash flow is coming from. And then we've talked about like Bowling Alley or Marina Software. Uh, roughly half of what they do is government software. Ooh. So a lot of stuff with municipalities, school boards, police departments. And what they stumbled upon is like the incentives are so messed up for these you know, public employees where there's no real reason for a salaried employee to lobby to change the software uh, mm -hmm. vendor that they're using. It's just like, why rock the boat? You know, no one gets fired for keeping the same software in place. <laughs> that's wild. I guess that's a, a interesting place to play, but it reminds me of some of the, the players that, that just, yeah, dig into this municipal municipality software, which it's funny, we, we were working on a separate project around this, what, last year around, hey, there's one player that does all of the building code management or all the whatever it is. And it really is, you do need software for this and you need, furthermore, you need like your community to be able to have access to information. So anyways, that's a really interesting detail that I actually didn't know that they were going after, which is the stickiest of the sticky. So it's really, obviously you wanna keep your software, your product working well, and you don't wanna just you know, deliver crap, but it, which kind of begs the question, like as an acquirer, it sounds like they're, they're going to be around. They don't hop in and just do cost cutting. They let, so my assumption is the, the companies that they're purchasing are generally profitable. They are looking for big upside outcomes. So there's, what is your sense for the, the payback? Do you have any details? It's probably all private, the deals that have been done, but one would assume that there's a four year payback and then all of the, the profits are now going to the consolation pocket. So I don't have you know, firsthand knowledge of the acquisition prices. I know that they are much more disciplined than other people that are playing in the space, other private equity funds, because they are not acquiring things and pushing for like immediate synergies or cross-selling right. or like raising prices dramatically or firing everyone and just like hiring employees abroad that are way cheaper. So they are, I've heard often pay like a one to 1.5 revenue multiples in this space, which is really low, but they're offering a really nice home for these businesses without the pressure to aggressively grow or anything. Mm -hmm. And then we haven't talked about how it's structured, but the company's employees that are acquired have like way more upward mobility than they would ever have in these like niche software companies. Like they could continue to move up and own more and more in these, in the business use units or the operating groups. Do they see, are you saying, let's say I'm working at the, the bowling alley software, I'm the, the lead developer 
and the product stabilized. I'm getting bored. It's idle. There's a possibility I could go work for a different portfolio company or, or maybe elevate up a level and maybe manage a couple of different projects. Yeah. So the way it's structured is Constellation exists and then there's six operating groups, which all kind of focus on different things. One I actually spun out and only does European software companies. Mm. And then others have different focus like industrials or whatever. And then beneath those is a bunch of business units. And then the business units are targeting one vertical and they're composed of multiple software companies. And so there's a pretty clear career path where if you're operating one business, you never, you never get forced to operate less than you were before. So mm -hmm. if you're really good at operating one, they'll put two under you. And then if you're really good at operating two, maybe you get put in control of a business unit. And then all the acquisitions, except for maybe the absolute largest ones are pushed down to the business unit level. So it's like these people that own a couple companies are the ones acquiring this third company. So that's how they're able to do 90 plus acquisitions in a year. It's because these business unit operators are empowered to make acquisitions up to four times the average acquisition price, which is mm. like, they could do it up to 20 million, I think. And the average is of 5 million or below. So like almost like little fiefdoms that can be created in these business units, which I guess is my concern would be if I was trying to do this, let's say without knowing anything about constellation, but if I was like Mark and trailblazing this, like the first concern, let's say things are going well in your first, let's say year or two. And then, yeah, you start, you've got a lot of people that start to have a potential to weigh things down. So it seems like he's got this idea to keep teams small, which I couldn't agree more with and give people autonomy, which is probably hard when it's, Hey, I raised this money and you, you have an initial founding team, but then you start adding more and more people like do, do directions and incentives start to, to conflict. It seems like it would get hard, but obviously he's managed it like a pro. So he, yeah, a lot of what he talks about is keeping everything human scale. And so in my article, I just embed a bunch of his excellent quotes. on talking about uh, keeping things human scale and why he does that. But basically his background is team sports. So he loved working with small teams and like accomplishing big things. And then in the venture capital world, he saw small startups like race ahead of big companies. And he saw like the power of these human scale teams. And then personally, he just got in trouble. Like he hates authority and he got in trouble a bunch as a kid. And anytime anyone tried to force anything on him, he'd rebel against it. And so he just, it's management by abdication is what he calls it. <laughs> I love that. It's, so he just believes like this is the best way to operate. So they're giving up like synergies for sure and cross-selling and maybe they could do better, but it's the only way to like really incentivize people to do the best work he believes when there's these small teams and people are more focused on like trust and communication and growing the pie than on like a political squabbles or something that happened with a larger company. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with that philosophy. I think, especially from a tech perspective, I think three engineers can do, they can do far more than a, a team of 10 because there's just so much more marginal value that it gets added. As you add more people, you, you just get less and less out of the team is what I mean to say. And a small teams is the way to roll. And I, I just haven't seen it done at scale. And I guess this is a good example of it. And, and it takes very careful organization, I think. So once things start getting big, like keeping it, it so it feels small and people can make decisions. So these business units uh, and operating groups seems to be quite the, the interesting way to, to segment things. It is a bit of a question now at this point that they've grown so large, like how much bigger can they get? And so it's leaked out that they have basically our CRM of 40,000 plus of these VMS software companies <laughs> that fit in their like target. They've acquired 500, but there's 40,000 plus to go. And they <laughs> think it's expanding faster than ever. It sounds like it's easier and easier to make software. So they, they said it's growing 4,000 companies. A year. And so th this, if we're stumbling into the space, it's, is it competitive? Like it's, no, it's not that competitive. The biggest <laughs> one is only acquired 500 of these 40,000. Yeah. Uh, one other thing is what they're doing now, they've acquired so many of these, but they have gotten so big that they have started doing bigger acquisitions. Mm -hmm. So they did one for 250 million in 2018 and one for 270 million in mm. 2014. And they said they're going to be doing more of those going forward as well. 
What's the profile of these larger companies? Is it CRMs or is still vertical? But like, at what point do you start running into a big software company? Like, to a, in a sense, like an Intuit could be considered a vertical software. Not so much now that I think about it. It's like, it's a, but if you were to just buy QuickBooks as a, a single business, as, as if it was, it's, okay, we just do accounting software. But then again, it seems like QuickBooks can be used for, you know, a broad range of purposes beyond just keeping books. Ah, that's a good question. I actually didn't look at what they do. It looks like one is a conglomerate as well. And one does like point of sale terminals, which I think vertical market software, like they could be billion dollar companies, but you could also, if you stumble into horizontal, you could get things that grow much faster. But yeah. then you also have more downside there is like Google or Microsoft or whoever would find that market appealing and come after you. Uh, hmm. So maybe less durable, but higher upside, which is always a balance between vertical and horizontal approaches. I wonder how their technology works. Like, you know, you, you buy up all these companies and, and one thing we're already seeing just with one company and, and looking at the seconds and thirds is it's different stacks and it's different philosophies. You know, there, there are standards that we want to accept, but everybody's, every business is in a different spot and has a different sort of tech landscape. I wonder how they're able to you know, manage that. And if there are efficiencies that can be created across companies, like everyone's doing the same thing. I mean, you've mentioned it. Somebody's quote of a software just, it tastes like chicken, which is kind of minimizing when these are software <laughs> companies, it's okay. It tastes like chicken, but it's the economic engine for your entire business and fund. It's, you got to give it a little bit more credit than that. And maybe his point is it doesn't matter as long as it works. But. Yeah. So this was Robert Smith. I think the wealthiest black man in America, he's the founder of Vista Equity. And it is a somewhat insulting to a technologist like yourself, but <laughs> he acquires these software companies and he just says software companies taste like chicken. Yeah. So they're all selling the similar thing. They all operate in a similar way. And he's yeah. quite removed from the actual technology at this point. Yeah. He's probably right to a, to an, an extent where if you're leading something like this, if you are abstracted away enough, it's a, yeah, people are going to argue about databases. Those neck beards are going to complain about this, that, and the other thing. But uh, at the end of the day, it's, you're just putting data into databases and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I think he's such a badass that he's a deal maker. He's less concerned about the, what did you write your software in? Is it PHP seven or is it Ruby? It's, he probably does not give a shit. Yeah, it is a bit of a question for us. If we do two small of ones, like then you only have what? One dedicated developer to it or at the moment, like you're helping out with some stuff. It is more of a pain. But once you buy these, I don't know, multi-million dollar companies, you have a team on it. Who cares, I guess, what it's being run on. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I would tell you, like, that's the one thing that I'm, I'm wondering about is are there efficiencies to be created across like, once you have a, a portfolio, you don't, of course, would never want to force something from a technical perspective, but are there like, you get one company that is in one spot, another company is in another, the cross-pollination, we definitely saw benefits in, our, in the venture portfolio across like getting tech leaders together and learning from one another and in really just pushing each other to, to write better software and build more stable systems and which resulted in less, you know, obviously less technical debt, but less long-term tech costs, which for Venture companies is unavoidable, right? You have this explosive growth. You're going to rewrite systems. You're going to make mistakes. The businesses are going to be changing. But for our world where it's like, hey, the, the roadmap is paved on and on and on to the horizon. That's where I feel like there, there is an opportunity to put standards in place, really like boring stuff, but it will have a much more, a, a bigger payoff because it's like, hey, you're investing in keeping these systems low maintenance and stable, and you're not paying for people to come in and you know, fix things all the time. Yeah. I may have made it sound like there are, like there's no advantages besides an upward mobility in your career trajectory for these businesses. But as soon as a business is acquired, CSI or Constellation shares best practices in like company-wide performance data. Mm. So they are sharing like Vista Equity has a hundred point checklist that they're famous for. I suspect that Constellation has something similar where it's like, hey, do all these best practices you don't have to, we're just recommending that you do. This is a great way to grow and make sure you're getting the most out of things. And a lot of this yeah. looks like connecting people that are doing similar things as you alluded to more so than like hard structured centralized stuff. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Clearly this is a model that works. I don't know if he's marks uh, the first 
of his kind, but this is definitely a model that I would continue to model ourselves off of. This is, I think in terms of there's 40,000 targets potentially out there, they've invested in 500. We're dipping into one to two so far, and it just seems like there's a lot of room for growth. But furthermore, like I think the idea of doing a couple deals is easy compared to, hey, doing 10 a year. And after year five, you've got these 50 companies or so. How do you scale that? And so I think that's where the real genius is here is like navigating the, the scale challenges. He had, I don't have the exact one in front of me, but I think a couple of years ago, he decided that the head office got too big and he cut it by 80%. Hmm. And he's look, we're not doing any of this work anymore. I'm pushing it all down to the operating groups and the business units. Mm -hmm. And it, it would uh, like the company rocketed up from there. Like it did not have a negative impact on the company whatsoever. So I think you have this like natural tendency to bloat a little bit and then you ruthlessly, you know, cut down and push it down to the people actually doing the work. Sure. Yeah, I like it. I think I like his style. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, he's uh, fascinating. It's a bit of a discussion like how much of this do we want to take as we move forward and how much of it do we want to do a little differently? Is there anything that jumps out at you that you don't like or wouldn't want to do that way? No, frankly, <laughs> like it's a blue, it's a bit of a blueprint, right? It's, hey, and we don't have a ton of information. You have what you're able to glean from interviews and whatever sources you can find. And, and I'm sure that a lot of this stuff's private, but I think the, the idea of staying small is like something and not from a portfolio size, but from a like a person side, things get more and more complex with people. That's one of my main concerns. And my experiences with growing businesses is like the people are the the difficult part. That's the the real challenge. So that's where my head is at. But yes, there's nothing really that jumps out here that I'm like, watch out for that pitfall. Other than letting your head office get big enough where you're able to cut 80% of the people. So it's worth pointing out that as I'm focusing on how they've done it, he uh, has been a very diligent student of other high performance conglomerates, whether in the VMS space or in others. And he said two of like the top five were also VMS uh, high performance conglomerates. Hmm. So something here with these like super high performance business models that make it very effective. And he has stolen everything he can from like everyone else. And oh, I'm, we're just doing the same thing stealing what's worked before and uh, trying to put it into practice. I can dig it. Yeah. Is there anything that you were looking at that you're like, oh, we don't want to make that mistake? I'm a little undecided on the whole horizontal versus vertical. So you could go the VMS route. So vertical market software, you're capped on the upside, but then you're also capped on the downside. Mm -hmm. So no one's going to enter the Marina software market when there's a dominant player and people just aren't going to switch that easily. Similar with government, government software. But then if you do, you could do horizontal businesses. And I think the upside is much greater, but then potentially there's a bit of a discussion on how low the downside is mm -hmm. if you have Microsoft or Google coming into your space. So it could do that. And that's like a mix of venture capital and private equity. It's like venture equity or something when you have that maybe greater upside. And so that is something I think we have to think about if it's immediately cut as we talk with software companies, if they don't have a specific niche, like if they're too broad, too horizontal, do we just immediately cut them as like a first filter and stay with VMS going forward? I feel like it's, it is an interesting thing to be to true to, but as we're seeing from them, it's like some of these larger companies, they're at what point is that not real? It's vertical ish, right? It's, it's going back into it, right? It's like their accounting software that's vertical, but it's also can be super, you get into payments, you get into all the ancillary pieces, but how else do you grow? You know, software yeah. Network. I mean, Intuit's a $132 billion company. Mm -hmm. So I would, I don't know, is that vertical? It's a bit of a question as the software market gets so big. I like the, I love at least getting started. I, I like the space so much, especially around like the very specific, going back to bowling alley, CRMs, that kind of stuff is, I think there, it doesn't have to be this massive TAM or this giant, like, oh, the addressable market's, Huge. When you can capture a, a big piece of it, it's actually a sensible. My other thing I've like undecided on is do you, I think the software market is so big now that you can focus on just one thing. So like Andrew Wilkinson has WeCommerce, which is only, it's basically a constellation for only Shopify apps. Hmm. So like you could, he raised that on 200 something million just to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the fun part. 
I think you could do that. Like you could just be software companies or you could do something super specific like that. And just that like specificity, that nicheness is something you have to decide on. Yeah. We're going to change the name of the podcast to riches in the niches. Yeah. I'm open to it. <laughs> <laughs> it could work. Could work. Might be taken. Yeah. Uh, anything else you want to cover? No, this has been great. You got to check out Colin's article here. So you got to promote that on your Twitter or whatever else, but check out colinkeely.com. I'm sure you have it linked on your homepage, but it's, it's definitely worth checking out. It, it, I love these kind of, I like the one you did on, on Wilkinson back, that was probably like a year ago, but just all the different notes and all the different sort of investigation that you've been able to tie together. It's really good. Thanks. Yeah. Check it out. I'll put it on Twitter and everything. And that's it. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for listening.